So it's very true that today the diagnosis of brain tumors is much more reliant, not just on histology, but also on the molecular features of tumors. This is a revolutionary change that the new WHO classification introduced just a couple of years ago. So going away from morphologic features to molecular makeup is really the story of the day. For an increasing number of tumors of the primary central nervous system from gliomas to medulloblastoma to pilocytic astrocytoma to ependymomas and several others, we are unraveling a number of molecular markers that have key clinical information that is relevant for decision making and that is driving the shift in molecular marker-based classification of brain tumors. In 2016, the WHO classification transformed the way gliomas were diagnosed. It changed from a morphologic basis to a molecular basis of diagnosing gliomas. In particular, it had already been established in the 1990s that 1P19Q co-deletion, for example, was associated with better prognosis and associated with oligodendroglioma morphology or shape under the microscope. Uh, however, it was then determined that another molecular factor called IDH1 or two mutations were associated with a great majority of low-grade gliomas, especially in young adults. And it turned out that this created a stratification between IDH mutant and IDH wild-type gliomas. The number of markers continues to grow on a daily basis. There are a handful today that are substantially of great value in the clinic. For example, markers that look at MGMT methylation, which gives us information regarding the effectiveness of timozolomide chemotherapy. Markers such as IDH mutation status, 1P19Q co-deletion status. These markers give us prognostic information, as well as information that can be acted on to select therapeutics. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are a number of other interesting markers which occur in a smaller subset of patients, but give us actionable information. For example, some of the tumors have BRAF mutations. Some tumors, in fact, have HER2 mutations. Some tumors have ALK mutations if they're metastatic disease settings. In addition to that, we're also beginning to recognize that there are markers that give us information about the potential value of immune checkpoint inhibitors. And these markers are also beginning to play a role. So from going, starting off with a handful of markers, MGMT, 1P19Q, IDH, we now have a whole panoply of markers that we look at. Oligodendrogliomas are now defined, not only by their morphologic shape, by the fact that they have both IDH1 or two mutations and 1P19Q co-deletion. Astrocytomas are divided into those that have the IDH mutation and those that don't. The historic glioblastoma are predominantly IDH wild type, astrocytomas grade four. In addition, a brand new classification of gliomas was identified called histone 3 k 27 m midline diffuse gliomas. And that's based largely on literature in children the historic DIPG, or diffuse intrinsic ponting glioma, that was associated predominantly with children, tended to have about 80 to 90% positive for this mutation. However, now we're looking at adults, and it turns out there's a large proportion of adults who have midline tumors, brainstem, thalamus, other areas within midline structures that also harbored this mutation. It became its own category because these patients did exceptionally poor in terms of standard treatment, and no effective treatment besides radiation has been shown to date. Several of these markers were first identified primarily as prognostic markers. So typically a clinical trial would be done, a specific marker would be evaluated, and it would provide prognostic value. However, in the beginning, that's all that these markers did. Increasingly, several of these markers are now recognized as also being predictive. So increasingly, more and more of these markers are both prognostic and predictive. So for example, in the past, we thought that IDH mutation status was merely prognostic in terms of the ability to predict which patients with lower-grade gliomas 
would have superior or inferior survival. Now we know that the absence of IDH mutation essentially predicts lack of responsiveness to chemotherapy, but the presence of an IDH mutation strongly emphasizes the effectiveness of chemotherapy with radiation. The 2016 WHO classification not only helped to characterize tumors by their molecular basis, it actually more strongly correlates with their prognosis. In fact, patients who have IDH mutations in 1P19Q co-deletion uh, can actually live 10, 20 years. In the complete opposite spectrum, you have the histone 3K27M diffuse midline gliomas that actually average survivals are somewhere between six to nine months. And so you have a, a paradigm shift, not only in the diagnosis, but in the prognosis that you can share with patients. Treatment modalities are also being tailored based on the molecular subtype. Even what first-line treatment you use for these patients varies by the molecular subtype, by the grade, the age, other factors as well, such as functional status and patient preference. So there are a variety of imaging studies that are used to assess a patient who's newly diagnosed with a brain mass. This is before we know whether it was a brain metastasis or a primary brain tumor. The first question is, is this mass a neoplasm? To answer this, we use a variety of tests. The first is MRI. Second, we think of diffusion-weighted imaging. Third, we could use perfusion-weighted imaging. Fourth, we could use MR spectroscopy. Or even fifth, we could use PET-CT scan. In some patients, we could use a variety or a combination of these techniques to really make that distinction or determination. Second question is, what kind of neoplasm is this? Is this a primary brain tumor? Is this a metastatic site? Or is this an atypical presentation, something like lymphoma? To make this determination, there are a variety of key imaging studies that we use, and they include an MRI scan, diffusion-weighted imaging, perfusion-weighted imaging, as well as MR spectroscopy. Third, the question commonly arises is, is this mass resectable? As the primary treatment for patients with primary brain tumors is maximum safe surgical resection. To make this determination, we use MRI, diffusion tensor imaging, and functional MRI. Lastly, when a patient has actually received therapy, either surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, or a combination, our question is, how is the patient responding to treatment, or are they progressing? To make this determination, we use MRI, diffusion-weighted imaging, MR spectroscopy, and PET-CT scan. And in a majority of cases, we use a combination of approaches to make this determination. Now the current standard of care for patients with a newly diagnosed glioblastoma is radiation therapy with concurrent and adjuvant chemotherapy. And this is after a patient receives a maximum safe surgical resection. The current standard of care is actually to give 60 gray and 30 fractions. And this standard of care has really stood the test of time. There have been multiple trials in the radiation oncology world that have evaluated different radiation schedules or even fractionation schemes, including twice daily radiation, accelerated courses of radiation, using a stereotactic radiosurgery boost, or even using a brachytherapy boost. Unfortunately, none of those trials has actually shown a benefit yet, and therefore the current standard of care remains the same. Most encouraging is that there is an upcoming randomized controlled trial which randomizes patients to a higher dose of radiation or dose escalation in the setting of the patient receiving radiosensitizing concurrent chemotherapy. And we eagerly await those results. Mm -hmm.